Ever pondered on how important sea borders are to a country or how they are even determined? The concept of sea borders is an intricate one. It's not just about drawing lines on a map. It's about sovereignty, resources, international relations, and so much more. Sea borders help define a country's territory, extending their jurisdiction into the vast oceans. They control access to marine resources like fish, oil and gas, and play a crucial role in shaping international relations by determining who has rights to what part of the ocean. But how do we measure and divide these borders? The process is complex, involving a mix of natural and man-made factors, laws, treaties, and sometimes even contentious negotiations. There are principles and rules set in place, but as with many things in life, there are exceptions and special considerations. So are you ready to dive into the deep end? Join us as we delve deeper into the world of sea borders. The first step in this intricate process is the baseline determination. This refers to the low water line along the coast, essentially the starting line from which we begin to measure. It's like drawing a line in the sand, but this one has international implications. Now from this baseline, we extend a boundary seaward. This extension up to 12 nautical miles forms what we call the territorial waters. Imagine this as a country's own backyard in the sea. Here the country has sovereignty, meaning it exercises exclusive control over the water column, the airspace above it, and the seabed beneath it. But with great power comes great responsibility. The country must ensure safe and innocent passage through its territorial waters for all vessels. So we've drawn a line in the sand and extended our reach into the sea. What next? Moving beyond territorial waters, we encounter the contiguous zone. Just beyond the territorial waters lies the contiguous zone, extending from 12 to 24 nautical miles. This zone allows a coastal state to exercise control necessary to prevent infringement of its customs, fiscal immigration, or sanitary laws and regulations within its territory or territorial sea. However, it's not a free-for-all. Only specific laws apply and the right of innocent passage of foreign vessels is still respected. Moving further out, we reach the Exclusive Economic Zone, or EEZ, which can extend up to 200 nautical miles from the baseline. Here, coastal states have special rights regarding the exploration and use of marine resources, both living and non-living. They can explore, exploit, conserve and manage the natural resources, whether they're on or under the seabed including fish stocks. But remember, they also have a responsibility to protect and preserve the marine environment. The EEZ is not the final frontier as we now venture into the continental shelf. The continental shelf is the extended perimeter of each continent submerged under the ocean. Picture this as a gradual underwater extension of a country's territory, where it retains exclusive rights to explore and exploit the mineral and non-living material resources. Now let's delve into the principles of division. First up, we have the median line principle. Imagine a line drawn equidistant from the nearest points of the baselines from which the breadth of the territorial seas of each state is measured. This line serves as the boundary between two states. Next, we have the equitable principle. This principle goes beyond geography and considers factors such as the proportionality of coastal lengths, the population dependent on the sea, and the economic interests of the countries involved. It's all about finding a fair and equitable solution. These principles, however, may not apply uniformly, especially in the case of archipelagic states. Archipelagic states, with their unique geography, require special considerations. The geography of these states, composed primarily of islands and surrounded by vast bodies of water, presents unique challenges. These challenges often necessitate the creation of straight archipelagic baselines connecting the outermost points of the outermost islands. This allows these nations to claim the waters enclosed by these baselines as internal waters rather than territorial seas. However, the establishment of these baselines and the subsequent division of sea borders is not a solitary endeavor. It's a dance of diplomacy and negotiation between nations Countries must come to an agreement about their borders, often through peaceful negotiation and dialogue. This process can be as simple as adopting a median line principle, where the border is drawn equidistant from each country's coast. But in some cases, it might involve the application of the equitable principle, 
a more complex method that takes into account factors such as the length of coastlines and the economic interests of the countries involved. The role of international law is pivotal in these negotiations. Frameworks like the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea provide guidelines and principles to ensure the negotiations are fair and equitable. When diplomacy fails, countries may turn to international arbitration and courts. This ensures that disagreements over sea borders do not escalate into conflicts, preserving the peace and stability that is so vital in our interconnected world. International arbitration and courts serve as the final arbiters in disputes over sea borders. They are the grand stage where countries can peacefully resolve their disagreements over maritime boundaries, ensuring that the laws of the sea are upheld. International arbitration, for instance, is a process where two or more parties agree to solve their disputes outside of court, generally by a panel of experts in maritime law. The decisions made in these arbitrations are binding, meaning the parties involved must adhere to the outcome. A classic example is the historic arbitration between Bangladesh and India in 2014, which peacefully resolved a decades-long dispute over their maritime boundary in the Bay of Bengal. On the other hand, we have international courts such as the International Court of Justice and the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. They interpret and apply international laws, including those concerning maritime boundaries. One of their most renowned cases was the dispute between Peru and Chile, which was settled in 2014 by the International Court of Justice. These institutions ensure that disputes over sea borders are resolved in a manner that respects international law and the rights of all parties involved. They maintain peace and order on the high seas, allowing nations to focus on cooperation rather than conflict. Understanding sea borders is crucial to appreciating the complex dance of international relations.